Thank you, Harold, for reading and praying for us, leading us in prayer. And thank you to those of you that were praying for Ellie and I in our travels to Florida last week, uh, last weekend. It was a wonderful time, sunny and 80 degrees most of the time. It was uh, a little tough getting back on that plane to head back to, I sent my mom a video of like the, the day after we got back, we got back Tuesday and then Wednesday, it was just like freezing rain and like, you know, 35 degrees. And I took this video and I was like, well, here we are back in good old Pennsylvania. That's right, where that's like false springtime and then back to winter. <clears throat> well, uh, if you don't have your Bibles out already, get them out and let's turn to Colossians chapter 1, which Harold uh, read for us a little bit ago. And I want to start with a question. Have you ever uh, lacked the motivation to l- trust and live for God? Have you ever lacked the motivation <clears throat> to trust God and to live for him? We sang these songs about how we are called to be God's people who are, you know, loving each other and living for the Lord and all of this. <clears throat> and if you're anything like me, it's, uh, it's not always easy to have that motivation to do that. So what's the solution? You know, there's a lot of uh, stuff out there that promises to revitalize your spiritual life. Some of it is helpful. There's, you know, Bible study tools, devotionals, Christian retreats and conferences and things like that. There's plenty of stuff out there that uh, even within those categories I just mentioned, uh, which either intentionally or unintentionally lead you further from God rather than closer to him. Promising promising revitalized faith, but actually uh, doing the opposite, focusing on man-centered kind of methodologies that, uh, that don't really have any impact. On one side of the spectrum, there are teachings out there which try to remove biblical truth from the equation, perhaps minimizing our sin and just focusing on positivity. Promises a better spiritual life, but in the end... As the proverb says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but it leads to death. On the other side of the spectrum, there are teachings out out there which serve only to further burden you by heaping up expectations or requirements that the Bible never does. And I think that's the danger that Paul and Timothy wrote against in the book of Colossians. We're starting a study today of Colossians. It'll probably carry us uh, into the beginning of July um, if, uh, if the way I mapped it out uh, ends up happening. And we'll see what God does with it as we go along. But we're starting with Colossians, uh, this opening section of Colossians. And, and we realize here that it was a, uh, originally a letter written to a group of Christians who were either in danger of hearing or had already been hearing teachings that would point them away from their foundation of their faith, which is Jesus Christ, and towards side issues which would only serve to lead them astray. So Paul and Timothy are writing this letter to them to encourage them to stick to the truth not to get sidetracked with these other things. And in the opening of the letter, we get this beautiful expression of thanksgiving to God, which helps to set the stage for the larger message of the letter. I think as we look at this opening expression of thanksgiving, we're going to be reminded of the foundational motivation for our love for the Lord and our love for others, which is the hope of the gospel. The hope of the gospel is the foundational motivation for our love for the Lord and our love for others. And it's my prayer that not only today, but each Sunday ahead as we study the book of Colossians, God will stoke in our hearts a greater wonder and awe at the beauty of the gospel. And it will lead to greater motivation to trust and live for him. So let's dig in. As we're studying uh, Colossians, we, of course, have to begin at the very beginning with the first eight verses, what we're hoping to focus on today. And and the first thing we notice, as we do in almost all uh, letters written 
from that time period, and certainly the letters written uh, in the New Testament, we call them the epistles. That's, those are ones like, you know, Colossians, Galatians, Ephesians, Romans, First and Second Corinthians. These are the, the letters that were written to different churches in that day. What we see in the very beginning is a mention of the author and the audience. This was a standard thing. Letters of that time period would always begin by stating who the letter was coming from and who it was addressed to. Nowadays, when you send a letter, it's kind of the same thing, right? It's just that it's on the, the front of the envelope rather than at the, at the start of the letter when you're, when you're writing the body of the letter. Back then, apparently they didn't do envelopes. They just started at the top of the letter. Here's who it's from. Here's who it's going to. And that's what we see here. In verse 1, it starts off with Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. So the first the thing we notice is Paul is the author. He's writing likely from prison. Um, he, he introduces himself here as an apostle of Jesus, Christ Jesus, by the will of God. And that's going to be important as the letter goes on. Paul is going to start to urge these Colossians later in the letter that they need to hold to the truth of the gospel, the true gospel, and not listen to these other voices out there. And so he begins by introducing himself and reminding them of who he is. He is an apostle. He has authority, not because he worked his way to the top, not because he is somehow better than everybody else, but because God put him in that position. He says, it's Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. God has given me authority, and I'm speaking with authority in this letter that I'm writing to you. This is kind of the idea in the opening here. And Paul clearly states uh, that he is in prison later in the letter, in, in chapter 4. Um, he talks about in verse 3, he says, we want to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. And uh, it's most likely that he's writing while under house arrest in Rome. Um, it's near the end of his life, near the end of his ministry. He's waiting to appear before Caesar. And so he's under house arrest in Rome. And we find out from the book of Acts that during that period of his life, he was receiving all these visitors coming and going. And so when you look at the end of Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, you see all these names, all these people that he lists. He says, oh, so-and-so says hi. And so-and-so is greeting you too. It's like Paul's been getting all these visitors coming and going as he's under house arrest awaiting his trial. So Paul is writing this letter, but there's another name mentioned there as well, isn't there? Look at the second half of verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Now some people uh, have doubted whether this letter truly was written by Paul. One of the reasons is that its literary style differs a bit from some of Paul's other letters. You probably don't notice it. I mean, I certainly didn't notice it um, because we're not Greek scholars, right? We're not reading this in the original Greek and seeing uh, a, one thing that I read said that there are at least 34 words used here in the book of Colossians that are not used anywhere else in the entire New Testament. And so that's an indicator that, you know, when scholars look at that, they say, well, somebody writing this letter has a different vocabulary. They know more words than the persons that were writing these other letters, right? So that's one of the reasons that they would doubt that um, Paul, Paul probably didn't write this himself. Um, but it's interesting here, as Paul opens up with saying, you know, I'm writing this, and, and this is also and Timothy, our brother. Timothy is listed here in the introductory talking about, you know, the author and audience. Timothy is listed right alongside Paul as a brother uh, in the authorship of the letter. And so we have to wonder, was Timothy serving as a scribe, you know, for Paul? Was Timothy sort of a co-author of this letter, um, writing along with Paul? Paul was giving input, Timothy was giving input, it's certainly in the way it's addressed, it mentions both of them. And then as we go down through verses 3 to 14, it uses all these words, we, rather than saying I, there's a lot of we say this, and we thank God for you, and we are wanting this for you. We are praying for this. 
Later on in the letter, it does switch to I, and so there's certainly some ambiguity here as to how it all came together, how, how it all works. But we don't have to throw away this idea that Paul, Paul is the author here, because he's writing along with Timothy, and the Holy Spirit is inspiring all of it, giving instruction to his church and giving instruction to us even today. I like the way that uh, the, the one writer in the Tyndale Bible Dictionary put it. He said that the differences, it, you know, talking about the differences between Colossians and other books written by Paul, the differences are of perspective or emphasis, not differences that result in contradiction. So Paul and Timothy here in Colossians, they're not contradicting anything that's said elsewhere in Scripture. They just perhaps have a different emphasis in writing this letter. And that makes sense because you're writing to different people. The Colossians are not the same people as the Romans or the Corinthians or the Ephesians, right? So we are just trying to get, a, get our heads wrapped around the situation here. Paul is writing, probably while in house arrest, Timothy is alongside him. They're writing this letter to who? Verse 2. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Now these are people that Paul has never met. How do we know that? Colossians chapter 2 verse 1. Paul says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and all who have not seen me face to face. So he's lumping the Colossians in with all these other people who haven't seen him face to face. We know that Paul planted a lot of churches during his missionary journeys. He had three major missionary journeys and he planted churches. He encouraged people. Some of these Uh, letters in the New Testament, like Philippians and and things like that, are written uh, to churches that he planted, but this isn't one of them. We don't know too much about the city of Colossae. Uh, Interestingly, I found out that Colossae is one of those uh, ancient cities that was never excavated. It's never been, uh, you know, dug up for, you know, to try and discover what was there. So, If any of you kids want to become archaeologists, maybe you could be the first person to dig up Colossae and find out more about life there. There's still stuff to be found out. But we do know that uh, it was a Roman Roman, uh, province in southern Asia, which is now Turkey. So we've got, you know, this is a map of approximately where Paul would have traveled on his third missionary journey. Um, And you see... Right there in the center is Colossae. Um, He kind of, he was through that area, but the majority of his ministry, especially the preaching and teaching, the focal points were along the the shores, you know, along the the coastal regions of these different towns like Ephesus or Corinth or Philippi, Thessalonica up there on the the top left corner. Um, Colossae is is smack dab in the middle of, of everything, Roman uh, uh, ruled area of what was then called Asia. Um, now it's, it's Turkey. Paul is writing to these people, uh, as I said, that he never met. And so why does that matter? Well, it matters because we have to understand that Colossians, the book of Colossians, the letter written to the Colossians, is more of a general statement of this is what the gospel is, this is what you must know and live by, it's not as personal as some of the other letters are. So in contrast to something like Philippians, the book of Philippians, Paul is just like, oh, you know, he's saying all these, all these personal things about how much he loves them personally. With the Colossians, he's, he's never met them. So it's almost like having a conference speaker come in and share, share something with, with you that you don't know him and he doesn't know you. You've heard of him and he knows of you, he's heard things about you. And so he's trying to share the truth of the gospel in more of a, a general, universally applicable kind of way. And I think that, I trust that will be helpful for us um, all of these thousands of years later digging in and thinking about what does the gospel mean for me too? 
So, what is it that Paul and Timothy want these Colossians to hear? First and foremost, it's thanksgiving. The opening tone here is one of encouragement, telling the Colossians how much Paul and Timothy thank God for them. Verse 3 says, We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Why? Because of outward evidence of their spiritual health, of their spiritual lives. Paul and Timothy have heard about the fruit of the gospel in the lives of these Colossians, and they want to first start out by expressing their thankfulness. We find out later in uh, verses 7 and 8 that it was another guy named Epaphras who actually took the gospel to Colossae. He was the one that planted the church there, and he was the same one that brought the good news of their response to Paul and Timothy. So apparently he reported to them about at least two things. First of all, the Colossians' faith in Christ. Look at verse 4. We always thank God. I'm starting back in verse 3 again. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Since we heard of your faith in Christ. And this is the most crucial thing, isn't it? faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that it's by God's grace that we are saved through faith. It's not as a result of works so that no one can boast. God is gracious to us. He opens our eyes to him so that we might put our faith and trust in him and then we are forgiven. We are set free. The Holy Spirit dwells within us so that we are enabled to live for God in the way that we are called to. And it begins with that step of faith. Faith in Christ Jesus. You can't have spiritual health without trusting in Jesus. You can have stuff that looks like that looks like healthiness. You can have, you know, stuff that looks like you're you're living the good life. But if you're not trusting in Jesus, you're destined for an eternity separated from God in hell. What kind of spiritual health is that? So it all begins with faith in Christ, and that's the first thing that Epaphras reported to Paul and Timothy. He said, you know, I was sharing the gospel like you told me to over in in Colossae, and the people have started to, to trust in Jesus. And they say, praise God. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we heard about your faith in Jesus. But what's the second thing they heard about? They heard about their love for others. Verse 4 says, your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints. Now, all throughout the New Testament, we see the emphasis on love for others as evidence of God's work in your life. We find in uh, the book of James, he says, if you, uh, he says, you know, faith, if you say you have faith, but you don't have these works that, that show you love other people, what kind of faith is that? In the book of 1 John, we hear about, you know, if you say you love God, but you hate your brother, you can't have the love of God in you. So, and, 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 we see all these one another commands that the large portion of them command us to love one another. So the love for others is a great part of the encouragement that Paul and, and Timothy have here. What are the two greatest commandments? When somebody asked Jesus in Matthew 22, he said, what are the, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. So Jesus said, it's not one greatest commandment, it's actually two. Love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God, loving others. Look at what Paul, is, Paul and Timothy are thankful for. The Colossians, faith in Christ, the way they relate to God, loving God, and then love for the brothers. Loving God, loving others. This is the outward evidence that brings joy to Paul and to Timothy when they hear about this outward evidence. They say, wow, thank you, God. Thank you for doing this work in the lives of the Colossians. 
You want to gauge your own spiritual health? These two aspects are a good place to start, aren't they? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ to save you? Are you looking to him as, a, as the source of your forgiveness and salvation? Are you, have you repented of your sin and turned to him and said, Lord, save me by your grace? And then secondly, are you acting in loving ways toward others? Do you find that you genuinely want to help others, that you genuinely want others to know Jesus and to, to walk with him, to come to faith in him? Faith in Christ, love for the brethren. This, these are two of the things that they mention as being outward evidence of spiritual health. Now, if faith and love are the goal, how do we get there? Where does the motivation come from? That's what I started off with this morning, right? You ever lack the motivation to live for Christ? Well, Paul and Timothy point to the motivating factor in the next verse. What is the root of it all? Verse 5. Because of, he says, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for the saints, and you have these things because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. The Colossians hope, the hope that they have laid up for them in heaven, the hope of eternity motivates them to trust Christ each day and to show love toward others. I like the way the NIV uh, translation puts it. He says that it's the, the faith and love that spring from the hope you have laid up for you in heaven. Our faith and love spring from, they are motivated by this hope of eternity. When this life is not all there is, it sure helps us gain a different perspective on the trials of this life, right? As well as interpersonal struggles. When we understand the hope that God has for us in heaven, when we understand the hope of eternity, and when we look forward to that, then it opens up our hearts to love God more and to say, thank you, God, I, I trust that, that you will carry me through. I'm trusting you not just for my eternal destiny, but for today. Like Jesus told us to pray, give us this day our daily bread it's not like, Lord, give me, give me everything for the next 20 years so that I can have it all now and feel comfortable. It's, no, Lord, I'm trusting you for today. And when we understand and when we're clinging to that, when, we, when, when we're, our minds are blown by the wonder of the eternity that is promised to us, it stirs up the motivation to, to trust God but also to love others. To say, you know what? I was destined for an eternity separated from God. But instead, I'm looking forward to an eternity with God because of his forgiveness toward me. And now I, I feel I can forgive someone else that has sinned against me because when I see how much I've been forgiven, what right do I have? not to forgive this other person. When I understand the eternal hope laid up for me in heaven, and when, when my heart is thrilled by, with excitement for, for what is to come, it gives me a greater urge to see people that I love, or even maybe even strangers, have that same hope. Because I don't want to. I don't want to go and, and spend eternity in heaven with the Lord and 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 know that I, I could have. I could have shared that hope with somebody else, and I didn't. It's not up to you. It's not up to me to to save people, to to make them, to force them to believe in the gospel. But if you truly are looking forward to that eternal hope, then shouldn't that?
shouldn't that give you a motivation to say, I want to tell others about this hope too. I want to make sure that they have an opportunity to at least hear about it. So if they reject it, that's on them. It's not because I failed to share with them. Spurgeon is, uh, is famous for having written about, you know, if, if people must go to hell, let it be over our dead bodies, you know, you know clinging and, and pleading and trying to, to drag them back from the precipice. Um, I'm butchering that quote completely. But that's the attitude that Spurgeon is trying to, to capture here, right? It's this attitude that says, yeah, it's not my job to save somebody, but it is my job to share the hope. And I get that motivation to share, to show love to others in that way. I get that motivation when I am truly blown away by that hope awaiting me. When I have that hope. Where does this hope come from? It comes from the truth of the gospel. Paul says there, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this, of this hope, you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world is bearing fruit and increasing, it is also, it, it also does among you. The gospel is increasing and spreading and the hope of the truth of the gospel is spreading all around the world just as it is in you guys. So in one sense, there's sort of a humbling factor here, right? The Colossians can't feel too proud of themselves that they understood this gospel because Paul's saying, no, 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 this gospel is, is bearing fruit all around the world. This is to be expected. The kind of hope that you experience when you understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the good news about how we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and he became one of us, took our sin upon himself, died in our place, and then was raised again, and he ascended into glory, and he said, it is finished. When that truth has lodged in your heart and you get that, that hope, that's the same thing that's been happening, Paul says, all around the world. The gospel is bearing fruit. It's the true gospel that's bearing fruit. Notice the emphasis on the word truth. Look at verse 5. Um, he says, Of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. So he calls the gospel the word of truth. Why? Because there are false gospels out there. There are false messages out there that promise some kind of salvation in their own way. And Paul says it's this gospel is the truth, it is the word of truth. He says, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, you've had this hope. He says, he used the word truth again in the end of, of verse six. So in contrast to some of the other teachings they were getting, it was the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the truth that brings real hope for eternity and therefore motivates faith and love. And so we have to ask the question, does the truth contained in the gospel dominate our thinking? Are we swayed by other truths, quote-unquote, that don't actually bring hope? Instead, they bring despair or burdens. Paul talks at the end of this section about how they, they learned this truth of the gospel from Epaphras, their uh, fellow servant, a faithful brother and fellow servant, and he's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. He has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So again, Paul kind of circles back around to the thankfulness for hearing about all of the, the outward fruit. And there's no command here in these verses, but I do think that as we as we think about, well, what does this mean for me? What do I take home? What do we do with this? I think there's just one main thing that we ought to take away from this, and that is to celebrate and focus on the gospel. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago at our Friends and Family Sunday, right? How the gospel is important for 
believers, not just non-believers. The gospel is something that we live by. It's not just something we believe once and then move on. We live by this truth that we are one with Christ and it's he who has saved us and redeemed us and transferred us out of the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Father has done that for us. So how do we celebrate and focus on the gospel? Well, we recognize that the motivation for trusting Christ, the motivation for righteous living, doesn't come from trying harder next time, but rather being awed at all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. We need to be celebrating and focusing on the gospel. So here's some practical ideas. First of all, read scripture daily. I mean, this is like the Sunday school answer, right? Read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow, grow. (laughs) Did you guys sing that song? Am I the only one that sang that one as a kid? I just made up the clapping part. I don't know if that actually goes with it, but... But it's true, isn't it? If we want to be... If we want to have our minds filled with the truth of the gospel, we need to be reading it. We need to be reminding ourselves of it daily. If you don't have a a daily pattern of scripture reading, you you need to sit down and say, I'm going to commit to this. This is crucial. If you don't know where to begin, I would say begin with reading the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, or maybe even reading some of these epistles like Colossians or Ephesians that unpack the beauty of the gospel, of all that that God has done for us in Christ. Memorizing scripture goes along with reading it. Uh, You could memorize Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, uh, which we'll be studying next week. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Memorizing scripture so that it's there, ready to be used in moments of weakness and temptation and discouragement and all of those those moments in life where we need to be reminded of the truth of the gospel. I would encourage you another practical step would be to set aside silent time to meditate on the gospel's impact on your life. What are, what are the things that I'm fearful of right now? How does the gospel speak to my fears? What are the things that I'm joyful about right now? How does the gospel inform and motivate the joy that I'm feeling What are the plans that I have for the future? How does the gospel speak to what I ought to be planning? How I ought to be planning to use my time? This kind of meditation on on the truth of the gospel and thinking about what it means for me, at least in my experience, it doesn't happen just as I'm going about my my daily life. It's not like I'm it's not like I'm meditating, thinking deep thoughts about about the gospel when I'm, you know, doing the laundry or whatever. I have to set aside time to intentionally think about these things. Now maybe maybe by God's grace you're at a place in your life where you can meditate on things just as you're as you're doing other things. That's that's great. Um, do that. Keep meditating on these truths. But I think for many of us, we, we're so easily distracted. And I'm so quick to distract myself with entertainment or whatever else so that I'm not having to think deep thoughts. So set aside time for silence to meditate and pray and ask God, show me, show me how the truth of the gospel applies to these hopes and fears and anxieties and relationships and whatever else I'm dealing with. What do we need to do corporately? Well, corporately, we need to make sure we are making the gospel the main thing here at Bethany, right? In our Bible studies, in our home fellowship groups, in our... Sunday worship? Are we focusing on moralism? Striving for the outward fruit, that faith and love? Are we, are we just trying to strive for that without thinking about the root of it all? Understanding where that motivation comes from. Are we focused on striving to be good people or are we focused on true gospel-motivated people? 
life change. That's a challenge for all of us who teach here at Bethany and all of us who engage in that necessary work of talking with one another, encouraging one another, praying for one another. Are we pointing each other back to the gospel? What's your focus today? What are you, where are you looking for the motivation to trust God and to love others? That's the question. Let's pray. God, we, we look to you and ask for your wisdom. You tell us that uh, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously without reproach, and it will be given to him. And so we ask, we ask for your wisdom uh, to, to see the importance of the gospel, to hold on to the truth of the gospel, to reject the so-called truths that are really just lies, the false gospels around us. Help us, Lord, to, to keep looking to you and help us, Lord, to have that motivation stirred up within us to trust you, to love others. Thank you for the example of the Colossians, how they were doing those things and, and Paul and Timothy could write and, and express their gratefulness for it. Lord, I thank you for the evidence of the fruit of the gospel that we see here in our family at Bethany. We want to see more of it, Lord. Please do it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.